Okay, welcome to Computer and Network Security. Today's lecture is on asymmetric encryption. So, uh, picking up from our last lecture, we talked about symmetric key algorithms, and these are algorithms where the uh, encryption and decryption keys are both the same. So, if an intruder was able to get the key from uh, either of the sender or receiver, uh, they would be able to uh, decrypt the ciphertext and get the plain text back out. Uh, in addition, all the users who wanted to be able to communicate on the network had to have the same key. So uh, it needed to be distributed somehow. And this was going to be a tough problem of how do we distribute a symmetric key uh, just to the people that we want to have have it, uh, rather than um, anybody being able to get it. So we were going to talk about how we can uh, distribute keys today also. Public key encryption, uh, which is also known as asymmetric encryption, allows us to use a different key for encrypting and decrypting. Uh, so the Diffie-Hellman uh, requirements, uh, so two researchers came up with these requirements, um, so Diffie and Hellman. For public key encryption, we have three requirements that must be met. First of all, uh, if we encrypt plain text and then we run that through a decrypt algorithm, obviously we need to get the plain text back out. It needs to be exceedingly difficult to deduce the decryption key from the encryption key. So if we have uh, two keys and one of them gets out, we need to make sure that the other one is not easy to generate. And we need to make sure uh, that we can't generate uh, that encryption key, can't be broken by uh, just any kind of a chosen uh, plain text uh, attack. Okay, so Diffie-Hellman also came up with how do we uh, distribute keys? How do we exchange keys? So this was one of the problems that we had in our symmetric key algorithms, and we still have this problem with our asymmetric key algorithms, that we need to be able to distribute some keys. Um, so uh, what the Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithm allows us to do is to find a symmetric secret key over an insecure communication channel without prior knowledge of the other computer. So how can we exchange these uh, symmetric keys without somebody else in the middle being able to get it? So here is the algorithm for Diffie-Hellman key exchange of symmetric keys. Uh, so Alice and Bob want to be able to communicate with each other using a symmetric key uh, algorithm. So Alice and Bob agree to use prime numbers P, uh, a, sorry, a prime number P and a base G. These are public numbers, so anybody along the way is going to be able to know these numbers. Both uh, Alice and Bob need to know it, so they had to be able to communicate with each other what these numbers were. Alice then chooses a secret integer A. So Alice keeps this secret. Uh, nobody else is able to get this. Alice sends to Bob. Uh, a capital A equals G to the A mod P. So A is secret, and Alice sends to Bob uh, just uh, some number, which was generated from uh, the G and the P, which are public, and this secret integer that she's got A. Bob uh, chooses a secret integer B, and he sends to Alice the same thing, just the other way around, G to the B mod P, and he sends her uh, what comes back from that. Then Alice and Bob can both compute secret keys S, so Alice computes it with B to the A mod P, and Bob computes it with A to the B mod P. Uh, so you can see, using uh, this approach, and you can see the uh, example that I have over here uh, on the right-hand side, that uh, what they both did was they both generated the same secret key without knowing, or sorry, the same symmetric key without knowing what the secret integers were that the other person had. Now, these two computers are able to communicate with each other uh, without other computers knowing uh, what the symmetric key is. The reason for that is that they generated these keys using their own secret keys and then transmitted that back to the other computer. As long as both of those secret integers remain secret on both sides, the symmetric key will not uh, be able to get be retrieved in any real amount of time. Now, of course, there are ways to break any encryption algorithm. Brute force is one of the uh, techniques for doing it. However, uh, this little example here, I use very small numbers, and you see that it was still a little bit difficult. I mean, 5 to the 15 is not a very small number. But when you start using larger numbers, uh, even computers will have a hard time factoring the, uh, the product of large numbers, or um, in this case, raising it to uh, exponents. So even those would have a difficult time doing it. So this is the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. Uh, look at the paper down at the bottom. Um, and New Directions in Cryptography is the title of that paper. Take a look at that. It's one of the other instrumental uh, papers for encryption. So um, it was published back in 1976 and it's still uh, quite popular. So go ahead and take a look at that one when you have a chance. There are a few security issues that we have with the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. Uh, denial of service attacks, we're going to have this problem with uh, anything. So this is just where an attacker 
uh, is somehow going to deny service to uh, one or both parties. So here's just an example. An attacker can delete messages uh, that Alice and Bob are sending to each other or overwhelm them with unnecessary computation or communication. Just start sending a whole bunch of messages. Uh, that's typically how a denial of service attack works is that they, a computer will become overwhelmed because they're going to be receiving so many messages uh, rather than, uh, than bad ones necessarily. Uh, outsider attacks. An attacker tries to disrupt the protocol search by adding, removing, replaying messages so you get some interesting knowledge. Now this is an interesting attack or one of them where uh, a replay attack is where an attacker actually transmits uh, the same messages just at different moments in time uh, to see if they're able to get anything back out of it. So that's an interesting approach. Uh, insider attacks, obviously, when you have somebody who's inside of the network, they're a little bit more dangerous uh, and cause a little bit more problems than someone who's outside of the network. So an insider attack, one of the parties holds a static secret key, uses it in multiple key agreement protocol runs in an attempt to determine the secret key of the other party. Um, so if you're able to um, you know, start transmitting keys back and forth or transmitting uh, messages back and forth, you might be able to find out something about the other messages that are coming back to you. And then the last one, the man in the middle attack. Uh, this one is where w when they're transmitting their, their uh, secret, or not their secret integers, but when they're transmitting those uh, public variables back and forth to each other, the values back and forth, uh, if somebody's sitting in the middle, they can maybe take those and then change them and send them to the other side. And now what they do is they send it back acting as if they're Bob, if it was Alice sending it to them. And Alice thinks that she's actually communicating with Bob when in fact she's communicating with somebody in the middle. And that person is sending uh, a different message with the same data off to Bob and getting the data back. So uh, there's nothing that looks uh, fishy to Alice or Bob because they're getting the messages. They're actually getting them from uh, what seems to be from the other side. Uh, so where this is tricky, though, is that they um, are actually getting it um, encrypted with a different key than what they think uh, they're getting it with. So that's an interesting approach there. There's two questions that we want to answer uh, when it comes to communication. The first one, has anyone else read the message other than the person to whom the message was destined? And the second one, did the message really come from the person who is claiming to have sent it? These are the two messages that we have that we want to be able to answer uh, when we receive a message using these encryption algorithms. So here is uh, how public key encryption works. Let's say that Alice wants to send a message to Bob. Make sure that Bob is the only person who can read it. So Alice is going to start off encrypting the message with Bob's public key. The public key, when we have with public key algorithms, we have two keys. We have a secret key and we have a public key. Uh, the Public key is public. Everybody's got access to the public key. So everyone has Bob's public key. If Alice wants to make sure that Bob is the only person who can read it, if she encrypts the message, her plain text, with Bob's public key uh, to produce the cipher text, the only key that's going to be able to decrypt that message is going to be Bob's secret key. As long as he keeps that secret key secret, then he's not going to have any problem because nobody else is going to be able to read that message. So uh, Alice encrypts the message with Bob's public key. Uh, since we have P as the plain text, uh, we'll have P for the public key. Uh, we will use S as the secret key instead of using P as a private key. So we have a lot of P's coming uh, with uh, this. So we're going to use S as the secret key. When Bob wants to decrypt the message, he decrypts it with his secret key. So you see that Bob is in, or sorry, uh, Alice is encrypting the plain text with Bob's public key. This is Bob, so public P, Bob's key, B. And it produces the cipher text. The cipher text can then be decrypted using Bob's secret key to produce the plain text back out. Okay, so that's how we can make sure that when we send uh, data to someone that that is the only person who's able to read it. Now let's look at the next one, the authentication. Now Alice wants to send a message to Bob. Bob wants to verify that Alice really is the person who sent the message. So we don't necessarily care in this case if other people are able to read the message. What we care about here is that we want to make sure Alice is really the person who sent the message so that we don't have this problem with this man in the middle attack. So the way that we can verify that is that when Alice sends the message, she's going to encrypt the plain text with her secret key. Now, how do we decrypt uh, cipher text that's been decrypted with a secret key? We use the public key. So Bob is going to decrypt it with Alice's public key. Now, Alice's public key is public, and everybody has access to her public key. But that's OK, because we're not so interested in making sure that no one is able to read the message that Alice is sending. Instead, we just want to make sure that uh, we can verify that Alice really is the person who sent the message. And we can do that if Alice encrypts it with her secret key 
then we can decrypt it with our public key. And that way, if we're able to decrypt it, we know that Alice really is the person who sent it. And this is all, of course, assuming that the secret key has remained secret. If that got out, then we're not going to be able to uh, say anything about it. But we're probably not going to know that either. So uh, as long as the secret key remains secret, we will be able to verify that Alice really is the person who uh, sent it. Now, what if we want to do both? Alice wants to send a message to Bob, ensure that Bob is the only person who can read it, and Bob wants to verify that Alice really is the person who sent it. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to encrypt twice. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're just going to do both of them. We're going to, uh, first of all, Alice is going to encrypt the message with her private key, her secret key, and then that ciphertext she's going to encrypt with Bob's public key. Now, what that means, encrypting in this order, is that you're going to have to first decrypt with Bob's secret key. Uh, and then after you decrypt with Bob's secret key, you're going to have to decrypt with Alice's public key. So we do it in the reverse order when we're decrypting as opposed to when we're encrypting. Now, we probably want to do it in this order where instead, uh, some people may be tempted to say, well, let's encrypt the plain text with Bob's public key and then encrypt that with Alice's secret key. The only problem with that is that you've gotten rid of that second part of the algorithm then because everybody has Alice's public key. So anyone would be able to decrypt it with Alice's public key and then they would just have one more thing to uh, crack to be able to get the plain text back out. When you do it in this order, the first thing that you have to do is going to be uh, decrypt it with Bob's secret key, which nobody should have other than Bob. So this is probably a little bit more secure way of making sure that um, Bob is the only person who can read the message and that Alice really is the person who sent the message. Okay, one of the most popular public key algorithms in existence is RSA. RSA actually stands for uh, the name of three uh, researchers who created it. So this is R Rivis, Shamir, and Edelman. And uh, while at MIT in 1978, they came up with the RSA algorithm. It's a public key algorithm, and it also is public. Uh, the public key is uh, made public to everyone, and the security algorithm is dependent on, obviously, the private key remaining private. As long as that's the case, then this algorithm is going to be rather secure. Uh, it has been in existence now for uh, a long time, uh, 30, what, 30 some years or so, and uh, no one has been able to crack the algorithm. Um, and I'll show you exactly what it is because it abides by uh, Kirchhoff's principles of being public. So here is the RSA algorithm. So you start off by choosing two distinct prime numbers, P and Q. You compute N equals P times Q, and you compute phi of PQ is P minus 1 times Q minus 1. Relatively easy so far. Uh, Generating the prime numbers, that might be a little difficult, especially because uh, you probably want to generate very, very large prime numbers. If you generate small prime numbers, the example I'm going to give you today, we use very, very small prime numbers, because otherwise it's going to make it very hard for us as humans to uh, calculate some of the things that we need to. Okay, step four. Choose an integer e, which is between 1 and 5 pq exclusively, such that e and 5 pq are co-prime. That means that they have no common divisors. So uh, between those two numbers, the only numbers that are going to divide them uh, evenly will be 1. Uh, no other number will divide uh, the two numbers evenly. So that's what it means if those two numbers are going to be co-prime. And then the last step, uh, determine D such that D times E is in the set of 1 mod 5 of PQ. And 1 mod 5 of PQ, so I gave a little example here of what does it mean if 1 mod A. This is actually a set of numbers. Now you probably have learned the mod, uh, the mod and the percent sign in some of your programming classes. And you learned that the result is always going to be between 0 and uh, in this case here, if it was 1 mod a, then the, the answer would always be between 0 and um, a minus 1 inclusively. But this is actually going to be a set that comes back where you can take that number and then you um, uh, just add a to it. So uh, what I want is I want to want to know that uh, d times e here that I have on the left hand side is going to be, if I do a d times e mod phi of pq, what I want to get is a 1. And so there's going to be a lot of numbers that uh, abide by that, such as a plus 1, 2, a plus 1, 3, a plus 1, and so on, if a is uh, what I have here on the right side inside of my mod equation. So this is a set. You can look up more information about uh, the mod algorithm, modulus algorithm, uh, but this is actually a set of numbers. So there are a lot of different numbers that are going to abide by that. Uh, what's going to be difficult, though, is since we already know what our value E is, what's going to be difficult is how do we generate this value D such that this D times E is going to fall somewhere into the set that we're looking at. The way that we do that, there is an algorithm called the extended Euclidean algorithm. 
I'll show you that algorithm here uh, in just a second. And uh, the, it takes two parameters, an A and a B. So if we use E as our A and B, it, uh, sorry, if we use E as our A and phi of PQ as our B, we're going to be able to uh, solve that and get our value of D. Okay, so once we do that, those are the five steps of the RSA algorithm. And uh, the, the public key is then going to be N and E, and the private key is N and D. So uh, you just need to keep this, this variable D that you generate here in this fifth step. You keep that secret, and you have uh, uh, your private key for the RSA algorithm. To encrypt it, we use this formula here. So our ciphertext is going to be our message here. This is our plain text M. Uh, raise that to the E mod N. You're going to have to somehow figure out how you're going to uh, represent your plain text. This could just be an ASCII value. Each character can be encrypted individually. Uh, you can group them together into some kind of a logical ordering uh, and then raise that to the eth power and then modify in and so on. So however you're going to do this, it just has to be agreed upon to the other side. ASCII is typically uh, a good way of doing it. You encrypt each character individually. You could encrypt the entire file uh, depending on how uh, you've represented the file and so on. To decrypt it then, to get your plain text back out, your message, you're going to take your ciphertext, raise it to the dth power. Remember, this is going to be your private key, has D, and then mod that by N, and that will get your uh, plain text back out from your ciphertext. Okay, so we're going to go through an example. I'm going to show you how the extended Euclid algorithm works, uh, and then we're going to walk through an example using RSA. So um, the Euclidean algorithm finds the greatest common divisor of, of A and B. The extended Euclidean algorithm finds x and y such that d equals ax plus by, which is the greatest common divisor of a and b. Um, when a and b are co-prime, which is what we know, x is the multiplicative inverse of a mod b, y is the mul multiplicative inverse of b mod a. So what we're going to do is we're going to run this algorithm. We're going to uh, get the value of x back out, and we're going to use e for the value of a, and we're going to use 5 pq as the value of b. And then our value x that comes back out, that's returned from our, uh, our algorithm down here, our value x is going to be our value d that we need for our RSA algorithm. Okay, I found the, uh, some uh, Java code for the extended Euclid algorithm here. Uh, the website down here at the bottom, you can see this, uh, it's from uh, a website at Princeton. Um, it was copywritten, Robert Sedgwick and Kevin Wayne. Uh, but this algorithm here, uh, this is the extended uh, Euclid algorithm, so you can see the exact code for it. Uh, it walks through the algorithm that you just saw on the previous slide, and uh, I'll run this in just a second on our example from uh, of RSA, so you can see this run and see the values that are generated from uh, this algorithm. Okay, so here is the example of RSA that we're going to go through. So uh, we start off with uh, two values, P and Q. So I chose 11 and uh, for P and 29 for Q. They just both needed to be prime numbers. That was our first step. Our second step, compute N of, which is the product of P and Q. So N equals PQ is 319. 5 PQ, the product of one less than each one of those is 280. Now we get to a little bit more difficult part. We need to find E such that the greatest common divisor of E and 5 PQ is equal to one. So we just need to find some value of E such that um, there are no common divisors between E and uh, 5 PQ other than 1. One easy way that we can do this uh, is uh, a prime number. So uh, you see here that I've taken 3 as my value of E. 3 does not divide 280 evenly, um, and there are no other divisors of uh, the number 3. So uh, that means that this number is going to be uh, relatively prime to 280 to 5 PQ. Now here comes the step where we need to use uh, the extended Euclid algorithm to find D such that DE uh, is in the set of 1 mod phi of pq. So phi of pq is 280, e is 3. So if we run our algorithm now, the extended Euclid algorithm, so uh, I compiled the extended Euclid.java file uh, that I showed you on the previous slide. If we run this now with 280 as our a and 3 as our b, so remember we're going to use phi of pq and um, uh, e as our two values. You can actually switch these around because if you notice from the algorithm, let me show you that again here, if you notice from uh, the algorithm, what it does here is it uh, switches them around uh, right off the bat here. So if you happen to reverse them, it's going to switch them around. It's still going to work out uh, just fine for you. <coughs> okay, so let me go ahead and run uh, this algorithm here. And you see that what pops out here um, is going to be this 1 times 280 plus a negative 93 times 3 equals 1. The number that we want is that one right there, that negative 93. Um, so negative 93 is going to be our value of D.
Mm. Okay, so there's our public key and our secret key. If we want to verify this negative 93, let me go ahead and uh, pull up a calculator here and show you uh, that that number is correct so you're not just believing that algorithm there. So if I take uh, 93, Okay, there's my negative 93 now. And I am going to uh, multiply that by 3, because that's that d times z that I have right there. So I'm going to multiply this by 3. That gives me negative 279. And you see that negative 279 uh, compared to 280 is going to have a, a remainder of 1. So uh, there's our uh, extended Euclid algorithm showing you that negative 93 times 3, which is negative 279, is actually in that uh, congruency set of 1 mod 280, the 1 mod 5 pq. Okay, so now that we have our private key and our public key, the NE and the ND, um, we can use those uh, in that, uh, the formula that we had for RSA uh, right here. So we're going to take uh, our plain text, raise that to the eth power, modify in, and then to get our uh, plain text back out, we take our ciphertext, raise it to the dth power, and modify in. Now, you see that these numbers that we've chosen uh, make this very, very difficult to do, because that would be raising it to the uh, third power for one of them, and uh, the other one will be raising it to the negative 93rd power. So this is, you know, with relatively small prime numbers, 11 and 29, uh, we still have a lot of uh, math, and this is going to take a computer a long time even to generate and, and to encrypt and decrypt, much less to try to uh, break this algorithm. <coughs> um, okay, so uh, I'm going to leave you here with uh, this last topic, uh, symmetric versus asymmetric. Uh, algorithm. So I want you to think about these questions. These are probably going to be the ones that I post for uh, the discussion also. Do you think one algorithm is better than another? Is one more secure than another? Why or why not? And the second question, which is a really good one, you might need to look this one up. Why are prime numbers commonly used in encryption algorithms? Uh, this is very, very common that in uh, these encryption algorithms we often will use prime numbers, uh, especially for generating the keys. And uh, see if you can figure out, look that up, and see why we often will use prime numbers uh, and the product of prime numbers uh, in our algorithms. All right, hope you enjoyed this. I'll talk with you all later.